My encouragement to you is to take notes, especially today. You're going to want to understand some things that I'm saying today about something that we will be doing for the last time today. And I'll make that clear in just a moment, and then I will make it clear why I say what I say. You know, one of the things in me that drives me since I came to Christ in 1985, I've been driven since the moment I came to Him with fullness of heart. I've been driven to grow in Him. I've never been satisfied with wherever I might find myself. Whatever I might have learned about Him, I've never been satisfied with that much. I've always continued to press in. That is the purpose of Holy Spirit, is to really invite us into a deeper place in Him. So on the journey of coming to know Him since 1985, as I walked this out and I began to move in that direction, every time I would learn something of Christ, learn something of what it means to be in relationship with Him, what it means to walk with Him, Scott, whatever that might be, every time I would learn that, I never found that or allowed that place to become a place where I would sit, put a chair, sit down and say, this is as good as it's going to get. I don't need any more than that. I've never been the person, those of you that know me, those of you that don't, you'll come to know this, but I've never been the person that has ever believed for even one second that this is as good as it gets. I've always been the person... It's in my DNA, it's the way that He created me, and it's always, again, it's just always been in me, that I'm going to press in. I want to go past where I am, I want to know more. I want to know Him deeper, and I want to know Him more intimately. I want to know Him in ways that others dream about. I want to live their dream. Others say, one day I'm going to walk with Him. I want to be the guy walking with him. Some dream of being able to hear his voice. I'm determined to hear his voice. I don't want these things simply to be something I dream about or I have visions of. I want them to be moments that I'm actually living in and walking in. I recognize no matter what I'm doing from day to day, I recognize that God has changed my life in so, such a drastic way from the time that I came to him to where I am now, certainly I'm not a perfected person, but compared to who I was in 1985, it looks like perfection. I hope that's true of you. It looks like it. I'm not perfect. He's still growing me. He's still changing me. I still get mad. I still say things. I have to go back and say, sorry about that. I still make my wife mad and have to go back and say, honey, it's time for you to apologize. No, I'm just kidding. I still do things. I'm still human. That's one thing that never changed about me. When I came to Christ, I didn't become something other than human. I just became human with options. (laughs) When I came to Christ, I became man with the opportunity to be redeemed. That's what changed. And when I saw redemption, I didn't see redemption as a one-time thing that I said to him, Father, forgive me. I repent of my sins, save my soul. I didn't see that as a one-time event. I saw that as something that was going to happen in me every single day. And then throughout that journey of coming to know Him and walking with Him every single day, pressing into Him, asking questions, learning, diving in, getting around people who had a heart like my heart, who wanted to know Him like I did, recognizing that there were some people I needed to stay away from because they didn't desire Him like I desired Him, and because their desires begin to contaminate mine, or begin to cause me to look somewhere else, or begin to cause me to become deceived, or begin to cause me to ask questions that were never intended for me to ask. See, when I came to him and I began to move in that place where I wanted to know him, it was a, for me, maybe this isn't true for everyone, but for me, it was a real easy choice when I received him on that Sunday evening, or Monday evening, in July, on July the 8th of 1985, when I accepted Christ on that Monday night, it was a real easy choice for me when I walked out of that church to immediately make decisions and change things in my life. Some of those I changed in my mind. At that time, I made this decision. It wasn't because God said, don't do this. It's because in my mind, I, and I'm just going to use me as an example, your, your examples will be different. 
But I walked out of that church that night knowing that he had saved me, knowing that he redeemed me. And I immediately began to question and, and wonder, and I was 19 years old, and wonder what in me, what about me, what's there, what's present, in, or I was 20, what's present in me that would not honor God? Even though I didn't really have the depth of that, there was something in me, which I know today was the Spirit of the Lord, but at the time I couldn't define it. But there was something in me that I know today was the Spirit of the Lord that said, Steve, there's some things about you I I just want you to begin to shift and, and, and address. And I walked out of that building and I threw away my cigarettes. I didn't drink any more Bartles and James. No more Mad Dog 2020. Those things were gone. I didn't go to New Bronzeville's anymore and fill up one inner tube with me, one inner tube with my cousin, and another inner tube with Bartles and James. We didn't do that anymore. And I just made some decisions, and I knew the friends that I hung out with and that I went places with and that I did things with, and I immediately began to make some adjustments in my own life. And it wasn't because I didn't like those people. It wasn't because I didn't care about them. It was because I know Steve Parker. And I know that if I take what has come into me and I insert it in what is in them, I'm concerned that what's in me will not outlast what's in them. So it's really important because I'm walking in this thing that I position myself so that I can hear clearly, I can see well, and he can change me into exactly what he wants me to be. Can anyone identify with what I'm talking about right now? So this was a journey that I took, and this was something that I did, and I started, and I moved into, and and then in the church where I was in Houston, Texas, where I got saved and... And I'd go to church, and then, I don't remember what day it was, but very, very frequently, they did this thing that we call communion. So they would gather, and we would know, and it was a large church, and we would know that on this particular Sunday of every month, communion would be served. So we would go in, and all the pastors and everybody would be, it was a large church, about 900 to 1,000 people, and they would have this, all this stuff sitting out there, and, and just like we do today. And they would be lined up, and I knew that, they were going to serve communion and that we were going to eat a cracker and we were going to drink some grape juice and then somehow everybody was going to go home and feel like that somehow they had eaten and drink and drank Jesus Christ and somehow our lives would be forever changed because we ate a cracker and we drank some juice and I could not even at that early point in my life with Christ I could not get past the point well what about Tuesday when I ate oyster crackers with my soup and I drank grape juice just because I like it Did that do for me on Tuesday what this did for me on Sunday morning? Can just walk with me today, okay? Someone might be thinking right now, well, you are making light of what communion is. I'm actually going to take the lightness of what communion has become and help you understand the depth of what communion is supposed to be. It isn't a cracker and a cup of juice. It is more than that. Somebody say, it is more. It is more more than that. Communion is deeper than what is in these plates and in these receptacles today. It's more than that. It isn't even about whether or not it's an oyster cracker or it's a grape juice. This thing has become so watered down that we call communion. It's become so watered down. If someone serves wine, someone's offended, someone else isn't. Someone's offended if it's grape juice and not wine. Someone's offended if it's wine and not grape juice. Someone's offended if it's an oyster cracker and not unleavened bread. Someone's offended if it's unleavened bread and not an oyster cracker. So this thing has turned into and become watered down to the point where communion, nowadays, while in our mind it is important in our heart, most people have no idea what it really is. So I want to talk about that today. Can we do that today? And I want to get us moving on a path where we can dive into the deeper things. As I said, when I came to know Christ, and I'm going to try to wrap this up in 30 minutes now, maybe 25 minutes. I'm going to do my very best. um, Forgive me if I don't. Love me if I do or don't. But as I begin to make this journey, what I want you to see and understand today is that what God has for you is deeper. I promise you. I, I can make this promise promise and be 100% accurate. What God wants to do for you with 100% accuracy in every single person in this room, your mind has not yet conceived it. You cannot, you have not yet conceived all that the Father wants to show you. 
And most of us, most unfortunately in Christianity today, most people will never conceive all that the Father wants to do for them because all they ever look at is what has already been presented to them. They can't see past what has already been established. And because the establishment prevents any further digging in, they never get past that point. So most people can walk into a building today with their eyes closed and know exactly what's going to happen on Sunday morning because there's no deep expectation. I hope I'm making sense this morning. So I want to begin with what I was actually going to read at the end, and I'll do it again. But I want to begin this morning. You're going to find it in your notes if you're following along in the app. It's at the bottom uh, because I wasn't planning to read it now, but I'm going to. It's Luke 22:19, and it says, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to them, and he said this. He said, this is my body, which is given for you. It's important that you understand what he just said. Say this with me. Say, he said. Who's he? Jesus said, this is my body. Everybody say, he said, said, this is my body. body. Thank you. Which is given for you, he said then, he said, do this in remembrance of me. What in the world does that mean? Now in most places today and most of most minds today, most people who call themselves believers today, they will focus on that. In fact, you will see that on communion tables in just about any church you go to. At the top of that oak-stained communion table, it will say, do this in remembrance of me. You will see it on their little placards on the side of the wall, depending on the denomination you're going to. It will say, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. There's a focus on doing something in remembrance of him, as though... You forget all about him until you do this. That communion somehow is the reminder. Oh, I totally forgot. I'm a believer. Slipped my mind till I drank this. Are you tracking with me? So he said, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. What does that mean, really? What we've taken that to mean is that do this often because we want to remember that he died on the cross and that he rose from the dead. And that isn't it. If I do communion, like we've always done communion, we're going to do that today, but this is the last time we will ever in the Rock of Central Florida take communion like we're taking, receiving it today. We don't take it, we receive it. This is the last time we will ever receive communion like this in this house. And there's a reason. Because it isn't what he established. This was not his intent. It's really simple. When I tell you what his intent was, You're going to be like, some of you are going to say, you know, I knew that. I just didn't wrap my mind around it. It seems like I almost taught on this a few years ago, but I don't remember if it was with the whole house or with just a few people that I was speaking about with this, about this with. But he said, do this in remembrance of me. So what we've taken that as, as the church, is we've taken that from the perspective of, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me, so do this often. Because I want you to remember me all the time. I want you to remember that I died on the cross and that I rose from the dead. But remember, he had not done that yet. (laughs) That had not happened yet. He had not died on the cross. He had not walked down the Via Dolorosa. None of that had happened yet. He hadn't even been betrayed yet when he said this. As often as you have communion, as often as you eat my flesh and drink my blood, I want you to remember this, not that I died on the cross and rose from the dead for your sins. I want you to remember this, that I made a way for you. Because before he died on the cross, before he rose from the dead, get this, if you get nothing else, put this in your notes, before he died on the cross, before he was raised from the dead, before you repented to him, before any of that happened, he had already made a way for you.
He said, what I want you to remember is what I'm bringing you out of. What I want you to remember is what true communion really is. So let's dive into what it has become, and let's, let's move through this and, and hopefully get an understanding of this by jumping in right off the bat to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning with verse 1, reads like this. Now, as I read this, this is going to seem so contrary to what we're doing today. Some of you might be hearing what I'm saying and think, oh, man, this is rough. This is, this is uh, just is everything opposite of what communion is, and yet it's not. See, this is a teaching that Paul is doing about serving idols other than Christ. He's talking to them about idolatry and all the things that get in the way of serving Christ. Talking about all of the things that get in the way of serving Christ, and then I'm going to go ahead and add this parenthesis section in here. All the things that get in the way of serving Christ, all the things that get in the way of true communion. Communion is serving Christ. Communion is not eating grape juice or drinking grape juice and eating a cracker. So Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. He says, For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. I don't want you to be aware that Moses and Israel, when they were leaving Egypt, miracles happened. That's what he's addressing. Do not want you to be unaware that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And all of them ate the same spiritual food. All of them drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Isn't it interesting that Christ was with them even then? They had relationship with Christ, not when he came through the loins or the womb of Mary. Remember, Christ is the anointing of God. Jesus is the man. So Jesus Christ is Jesus, the Son of God. Christ, the Son of God. You got another time. For they all drank from the spiritual rock, even then that followed them, and that rock, even then, was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, even though they passed through the cloud, they passed under the cloud and through the sea, they were baptized into Moses, they ate the same spiritual food, drank the same spiritual drink, and they drank even from the spiritual rock that followed them that was Christ, and still most of them, with most of them, God was not pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Wow. Why were they? Because they misinterpreted the rock that followed them. They did not really recognize the rock that was following them. They did not really recognize the anointing available to them, the power of God that was present behind them and in front of them and around them. They didn't recognize it. Verse 6. Now, these things took place as examples for us, and I'm thankful for those, that we might not desire evil like they did. Can I just say this? Let me read 6 again and just say, he said, now these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. I didn't know this scripture when I got saved, but there was something about this scripture that came alive in me, just like I mentioned a moment ago, when I did get saved, or when I started my journey of salvation. That happens every day. I'm getting saved every day, more and more every day, more and more every day. I came to Christ on July the 8th, 1985, and I've been coming more into him ever since. I've been being, I've been, I'm baptized more into him every single day. But this little verse right here, he says, so that we might, desi- might not desire evil as they did. It be- even my hunger for him, one of the reasons that I begin to separate those things, couldn't explain it, didn't understand it, but I know one of the reasons he began to show me, Steve, separate yourself from these and these and these because you are not, you are, you get around, you bring me into those situations, you're going to desire things that aren't count- accounted to you. Watch where you're going, Steve. Keep your head up and your eyes open because I'm showing you something. Count me as this. I'm a flashlight lighting your way. And when I reveal something to you that's outside of my purpose, go left or right. But I'll prepare another way. Now, these things took place as examples for us so that we might not desire evil like they did, even while they were eating and drinking in him. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. 
Now, these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction. To them, it was an example for you. Written down on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. In other words, none of us are dealing with anything today that they did not deal with as they crossed the Red Sea. None of them. I just said to somebody the other day, I'm not sure who it was. I think it was my wife and I when we were doing our walk. And and she mentioned or whoever, somebody mentioned, and they talked about where we're at in the world today. And, you know, people are facing things today that they've never faced. This generation, it's so hard for this generation. It's untrue. It's no more difficult for this generation than it was for mine. There's no more, it was no more difficult for my generation than it was for the one before me. The challenges change, but they're not any different. It's not any different. The challenge looks different. It has a different face. But the temptations are no greater now than they were when they were crossing the Red Sea. Is anybody hearing what I'm saying today? So this is what I know. If I can accept that, I can accept this, that the same Christ that was the rock that followed after them is the same Christ that is the rock that's following after you. So no matter, even if the challenge has changed, the face is different, what you're going through is different in this generation than the one before it, it is the same Christ following after you, providing a way through it. The temptation, there is an answer for every temptation, and that is the rock who is Christ following after you. Just wanted to insert that this morning. Therefore, let anyone who thinks he stands take heed so he doesn't fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. For God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. What does that mean? I speak to us as to sensible people. That means I'm talking to people who you know, just like I am this morning. I am speaking to people under the sound of my voice today, whether present in this room or you're watching online. I'm speaking to people today under the sound of my voice that are sensible. That means that in your spirit, you make sense of all the things that are good and all the things that are evil around you. No one on this planet, no one breathing air is is incapable of knowing right from wrong. No one breathing air is incapable of knowing righteous from unrighteous. It is an eight in us. It is an eight, not in eight. It is an eight in us. It is, he breathed into us the spirit of God. When he breathed life into us, the pneuma of God filled our lungs, filled our body, filled us with a passion to understand rightness from wrongness and to begin to move towards those things that were right for him. All the while, there's an enemy that's trying to draw our attention to what is evil. And he says, I'm speaking to sensible people. No one under the sound of my voice, Paul says. All of you Corinthians today, you know what I'm saying to you. Even if you're indulging in evil, you know you shouldn't be because you know what's right and you know what is wrong. He says then, he says, judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not, and this is what I want to focus on. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation In the body of Christ. Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body. For we all partake of the one bread. Consider the people of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices participants in the altar? What do I imply then? That food offered to idols is anything? Or that an idol is anything? No. I imply that what pagans sacrifice, they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Hear me in this house. No matter what's going on in the world around us, no matter how watered down there is, I'm telling you there is a line drawn. The Father has drawn a line. This is righteous and this is not. Don't try to straddle the line. Shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than He? I know there's an argument today because people say, and especially 
this current generation, there's an argument. It's not just this current, it's every generation that comes up makes the same argument different way, but they make this argument. The world's changing, so these things should be acceptable. We should be able to do this, and we should be able to participate in that, and how are we going to do this if we don't go there, and so on and so forth. All the while, the Father's saying, you worry about things that are outside of your responsibility. If it was important for those people that you think you're reaching by going where you shouldn't be, if it was important for them to be among, around me and present in me, I will get them there. You don't need to go into darkness to bring them into the light. He said, I want to help you understand something today. I've shared this story many times before. I'm going to share it again this morning. I'm going to do this very quickly because I want to move along. But when I was a, a new youth pastor back a long time ago, and I was a new youth minister and I was doing this uh, youth ministry in Panama City Beach, and, and we were there, and we were doing some, uh, it was a, con- a youth thing, a youth uh, event, and we were there, and one of the leaders said, this is what we're going to do, we're going to go out here to the beach today, and we're all going to join arms, we're going to link our arms together, and we're going to walk down the beach, there's a lot of people out there, spring break, there's a lot of people out there on the beach that don't know God, man, they're wearing bikinis, some of them are wearing nothing, some of them are drinking, well, you know, don't know what they're drinking, eating, or, but this is what we're going to do, because we're holy. So what we're going to do, all of us holy folks, we're going to link our arms together. Now, keep, they never considered the fact that half of the youth group wanted to be out there in a bikini. <laughs> drinking whatever they were drinking. Smoking whatever they were smoking. Never considered that, but we're holy, bless God. We're going to link arms and we're going to walk down there and we're going to, whoever we run into, when we touch with this chain, whoever we bump into, we're going to, we're going to talk to them about Jesus Christ. We're going to lead them to Christ. And I told my youth group, I said, we ain't doing that. Because we're not going to make idiots out of ourselves. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard of in my entire life. And we're not doing that because what's going to happen, somebody's going to take a beer bottle and crack it over your head in the name of Jesus. In the name of your God. Somebody's going to flash you in her bikini. Just to get under your skin. Find out if Jesus likes what she likes. Can I just be real this morning? And I said, we're not doing that. But what we will do is we will go on about our business and we'll do the things that we're supposed to do. And as he brings them to us or he positions us in such a way that we find ourselves among them by the anointing and by because he's directed our paths, we will minister to them then. Not one person that they met on that beach that day. They never brought anybody to Christ. They were the laughing stock. They were a joke. The whole event was humiliating. Made the church look like exactly what the church has become to so many because they don't understand. And you, you might be asking, what does this have to do with communion? I'm getting there. I'm getting there. But what we do in the name of Christianity, what we do in the name of knowing God, what we do in the name of knowing Jesus Christ, What the church does in the name of knowing Him, we do through these principles and these ideas of what we've done for so long, and yet it doesn't really do these, i got to ask this, do the things that we continue to do over and over and over again do anything to get us any closer to the Father? Or are we simply hamsters on a wheel that keep spinning this thing hoping for a different result tomorrow when we know that the red bar is going to make its way all the way around and our feet are going to touch it again? Anybody hearing what I'm saying this morning? So what Paul is saying to them, and I address this because it was important when he said, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. And then he said, I speak as to sensible people, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? No one in the Bible took communion like we're doing today. Never happened. Never happen. See, I'll tell you why. I'm going to get there. But I need you to understand that this never happened. See, to have faith in Christ and to be able to distinguish between the bread of heaven and the bread of demons, the drink of heaven and the drink of demons, the table of the Lord, the table of demons, to be able to distinguish between that require something more than simply a quick five-minute Eucharist or a quick five-minute communion or a quick five-minute moment where we come and someone prays over this little cup that we're going to drink and and this little cracker that we're going to eat that's going to dry our mouth. (laughs) 
And in truth, I couldn't tell you in all the times, that, and, and, and just walk with me for a moment before I get to John chapter 6. In truth, I couldn't tell you how many times I've taken communion in my life and I look out and I see people that kids are laughing and people are looking at one another and they're making faces because it's bitter, it's, it's sour, and, and they're, they're making little faces and, and missing the moment of what their true value, what's really happening with this cup and what's really happening with this bread. I want to talk about that in John 6 today, flesh and blood, and what it really meant, what Paul was really speaking to when he said what's necessary. If you want to know God, you really want to know God, there's a requirement. You need to participate in his flesh, and you need to participate in his blood. It gets really nasty. It gets really gory because Jesus, he doesn't cut any corners. He doesn't cut any slack. He doesn't, he doesn't make it light. When he talks about communion, he really makes it plain. And he does it this way in John chapter 6. Let's go talk. Let's see what the bread of heaven is. In John chapter 6, beginning with verse 33, it reads like this. Jesus is saying to those that were gathered that day, he said, For the bread of, hev- uh, the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, those who were gathered, the Jews, they said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. I'm going to read that, those two verses again. He said, For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Communion did not start at the Last Supper. In the beginning of time, communion started the moment Adam was. See, I'll read 35 in a moment. But there's this idea in the world today that if I can just get to church and take communion, everything will be better. Because the Eucharist, communion, this that we do that we call communion, has become a substitute for what true communion really is. In verse 35, Jesus said to them, he said to the Jews that were gathered, he said, I am the bread of life, and whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. And we skip down because they're going to him, and they say, what are you talking about? We know your daddy. We know where you came from. We know who you are. How's all? And this is what happens between verse 36 and 52, and just going through all this argument that is taking place between the Jews challenging what he's saying. And then in verse 53, it picks up, and Jesus answers them, and he says, following their arguments that they know his daddy and how could he be the bread of heaven. Jesus says to them, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, I've heard every argument that you've made. I've heard you discuss for the last however many, 21 verses. You've been telling me for the last hour and a half all the reasons why I can't be the bread of heaven. So clearly you haven't heard me well, so I'm just going to make this really plain for you. I really want to help you understand what true communion is. And he says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and you drink his blood, you're dead. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. You are not living. You might be breathing. You might have a heartbeat. But breathing... In a heartbeat is not a sign of life. He said in verse 54, he said, Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. That's getting deep. That's another level. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and they died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood will have eternal life. Now, if Jesus Christ were to walk in here to this platform today, this pulpit today, if he walked through those back doors right now and he walked up on this pulpit and I had not said any of this and he said, now, in our mind, since we don't know what Jesus looks like, I understand artists do, painters do, all painters know what Jesus looked like. If you want to know what he looked like, ask a painter or a Catholic. They'll tell you. But if Jesus walked in here and he stood up on this pulpit and he opened his mouth and he said, if you want to know me and you want to have eternal life, you're going to eat my flesh and drink my blood. 
everybody, most everybody in this room, even if we knew it was Christ, would be challenged by that. In fact, if you read down a couple scriptures following that in verse 60, many, it says many of the disciples walked with him no more. This saying is too hard for us. And many of them walked with him no more. Even though they had been walking with him. Even though they knew him. Because what he was saying to them was, don't get caught up in this Last Supper thing. Don't get caught up in this moment where somehow communion has become about the death and the resurrection. When communion is not about the death and the resurrection, it is about the journey you're taking with me. He instituted the relationship. He instituted the bread and the wine before he died on a cross and before he, was, he rose from the dead. What is the point today? The point is this. What we've done in the church with so many things, what we've done in the kingdom of God, is we have dumbed down. We have simplified things that the Father wants to do on a grand scale because we don't have time for it. We say, let's dumb this thing down. We don't have time for what communion really is. What does the Bible, by the way, what does Scripture in Luke, what does the Scripture refer to last communion as? Or communion as? The last, what is it, Tim? The Last Supper. The Last Supper. So if I'm going to take everything that I've talked about today, and I hope you are following along with me, and I hope you're taking notes this morning. If I'm going to take this today, everything that I've said so far, he said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part with me. I can tell you, drinking this cup and eating this cracker has nothing to do with eating his flesh and drinking his blood. It's an outward statement of something we're doing on the inside, but it's not even a good example of that. Because when he gave communion, when he offered communion, he didn't do it in a five-minute routine. He did it over dinner. This will be the last time we will ever receive communion like this. Going forward, communion is going to be what communion is, and that is going to be over supper. It's not going to be about a little cup with grape juice. And I'm telling you today, if you're watching online, I want you to prepare now. I want you to get something in your house. I want you to receive communion with us today. And whether it's a cup, I don't care if it's water, I don't care if it's wine, I don't care if it's grape juice, lemonade, tea, it doesn't matter. But you get you something. Get you a piece of bread. Get you something to eat. I don't care what it is. It could be part of a Snickers bar. It's irrelevant. But get you something that you can eat and drink with us today has nothing to do with the power of God, what we're putting in our mouth today. I can tell you, Yahweh doesn't even know what an oyster cracker is. What he does know is the heart of man. And what he does know is how to interpret whether or not we really want to know him. What he does know is how far are we really willing to go. And see, communion, this this thing that we do, the way we do it, and we honor it. But the way we go about this thing and the way that we've done it for so long is to simply come up here and drink from that little cup and eat a little piece of cracker. It's deeper than that. He said, unless you eat my flesh and you drink my blood, you have no part in me. Paul said to the Corinthians as he gathered, he said, I want to tell you what you have to do. You have to learn to participate in the flesh of Christ. And you have to learn to participate in the blood of Christ. We do not participate in the flesh of Christ and participate in that blood by simply drinking something down. Participation means that's the life I'm going to live. There is a life I'm choosing to live that is in fullness participating in the life of who Christ is. I am go- my whole, everything that I do, it's not going to be about this simplified moment. And see, again, I want to make this point. The church world, we've dumbed it down so much. We've so simplified so many things that we do, even coming to church on Sunday morning. We make Sunday morning the monumental moment. Everybody needs to gather on Sunday morning, and I hope you do, and I hope you will, and I hope you continue to do so. But we make it all about Sunday morning, and the Father the whole time is saying, you're dumbing this thing down. Life with me is more than Sunday morning. How about Monday living? Tuesday living, Wednesday living, Thursday living, Friday living, Saturday living. Life with me is more than the time that you come together and you're all together. How about when you're driving down the road and you're all alone? That's life with me. That, what you're doing when you're driving down the road and you're alone or on a Saturday night at 7 o'clock and you're going off somewhere, that's what your life is. I'm asking you to demonstrate, are you participating in me when it's late? When all the devil birds are out? Are you participating with me when it's early? Are you eating my flesh? Are you drinking my blood? 
through the temptation, when temptation comes upon you, and I'm, and I'm, I'm really, I hope I'm pushing people this morning, but when t- temptation comes upon you and you're tempted to go here or go there and to compromise this or to compromise that, I want to tell you, eat my flesh and drink my blood. If the only thing that you can do is find a way to get away from that temptation, move off in a corner and say, Father, help me right now. Give me, I'm going to eat your flesh. I'm having communion right now. I don't have a cup of juice and I don't have a piece of bread. But I have you because the rock who is Christ is following after me. I have you. Communion isn't about what we do when we gather. This isn't even communion. This is drinking some juice and eating a cracker. Communion's what you did when you got up this morning. Communion's what you're going to be doing when you walk out of here this afternoon. Communion is going to be what you're doing tomorrow morning in the middle of the day. Communion, I'll tell you where real communion is. You want to know where you commune? To, it's going to be tomorrow when you don't get the promotion you were promised. Where, what are you communing with then? Is anybody hearing me? Communion is going to be this Thursday when you go in or Friday when you get your paycheck and somehow you've been shorted something. Communion is going to be when you're checking somebody out at Publix and they're in your line and you run the cash register and they come up and they're rude and they're ugly and they're saying all kinds of evil things to you. Who are you communion with then? Man, I'll tell, I'll tell you what I wanted to say. <laughs> I was about to say, you can go to Albertsons. <laughs> Is there, are there Albertsons anymore? <laughs> South Carolina. Yeah, go to South Carolina. See, the danger of what we're doing this morning is it's going to make some people, if we were to continue to do it this way, it's, it makes some people feel like this is the moment I'm holy. This is the moment I have no choice but to be holy. But when we change our perspective, when we realize communion is way more, communion is we're going to sit down together in the company of God. Sometimes I'm going to be sitting alone in the company of God, in the company of Holy Spirit, in the company of Christ. That's communion. The best this will ever be is to say this is what I do all the time. But even this doesn't do it well. That's why going forward, every time we have what we're going to, what we will call, I don't know what we'll call it. We're going to, we're not going to, certainly not going to call it the Last Supper, I promise you that. (laughs) But going forward, when we break bread together, when we participate together as one, we're going to do it over a meal. We're going to tear down every one of these chairs. We're going to set up tables. We're going to do it over a meal. We're going to cook for one another. We're going to serve one another. We're going to have barbecued chicken. That's way better than an oyster cracker. I'm going to smoke a brisket for 26 hours. That's right. I'm going to make my mom's cheesecake. It won, you know, a couple years ago in the fall festival. So I say all that because I don't want you to make light of what we're doing today. I don't want you to blow by it like, phew, I just learned that this isn't even important. Now, it's not, hopefully you didn't learn that. Just how we do it, we're not dumbing it down anymore. How is it possible to simplify? How is it possible to make small the great things of God? How do we ever come to a place where we make tiny the magnificence of a Savior? How is it that we can put into a few minutes, a few moments of eating and drinking and somehow capture all that Christ did so that we could know Him? Is anybody hearing me this morning? So in these scriptures that we read in John chapter 6, He hammers home this message. Christ hammers hammers home this message. It's about me. This isn't even about you. It says, when you have communion, when we are joining together, when we are sitting together, it's about me. And I'm bigger than the five minutes you give me on Sunday morning. (laughs) He said, I'm bigger than that. I'm bigger than the 10 minutes that you give me every day. 
when you accidentally think about me because you saw some church bulletin board driving down the road. Oh, yeah, I forgot. I got to think about God today. I hope what my words are doing today is provoking us to recognize that in us, there's none of us that are so good at being a son and daughter that there's no room for improvement. There's none of us anywhere that can say, I'm his favorite. Because I do so many things right. That's why I'm going to be at his right hand. And Jesus said, first shall be last. Last shall be first. He said, if you eat my flesh and you drink my blood, you will have life. If you do not eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. I taught this message some time ago, this scripture some time, years, a long time ago, about blood deep. It's titled Blood Deep. If you haven't heard it, I encourage you to go back in the archives on YouTube and listen to it. But it was a message titled Blood Deep. And what that meant is the flesh and the blood represent something very different. The flesh represents that that is superficial. It represents the the more visible things of God. That's where most people walk. Most people walk in a flesh relationship with Him. Most Christians walk in this place where it is everything's face value. They have no problem with a five-minute exchange of bread and wine because, hey, it's all good. But then there's those people who are blood deep. They drink his blood. Some people drink, eat the flesh, and they're happy with that. But then there's those who say, that's not enough. I want the, I want the blood. I want all of it. And that's why he, he would say to the disciples over and over again, he would question them, and he'd say, where's your faith? How long have you been walking with me? And you don't know this. Because you function at a flesh level. But I need you to get to a blood level. I need you to get blood deep with me. I need you to dive in, and I need you to... Hunger. I need you to ask. I need you to talk. I need you to inquire of me. Let me do miracles, signs, and wonders in you. And if you will allow that, I can change everything about who you are. I can grow you into something that you never even imagined you could be. So today we're going to serve in just a moment communion, what this is. We're going to serve the cup and we're going to serve this bread. The bread will represent today. His flesh, the cup, will represent His blood today. It will. But going forward, what will represent that is going to be our time together where we are sitting across the table from one another. And when we are eating our chicken, when we are drinking our sweet tea, or whatever you prefer, water with lemon, and you are drinking that, and you are eating that, in the process of, in the process of that, We're going to be communing with one another and saying, what does this mean to you? How has he changed you? Tell me about your communion with the Father. And we're going to exchange and we're going to engage with one another. So as a preclude to that, what I want to do this morning is I want to give an opportunity for a few people to, just a moment, literally just a moment, because I want to serve this communion today. But I want to give opportunity for a few people to come, and if the Holy Spirit has said something specific to you about what I'm teaching, if He's shared something to you, if He's shown you something, I want you to be willing to come, and I want you to tell me. Share it with us. Alex, come. I was thinking about this morning, um, especially when you were talking about when Jesus met with the disciples, um, you know, he said, do this in remembrance of me. They were physically with him in the sense of the man, Jesus. And I don't have to remember someone that that's with me. Mm -hmm. So I don't consider that statement a everyone moving forward, do this in remembrance of me. I don't have to remember Christ because he's in me. 
Um, it's not a memory. Memories are of people that are that are no longer right. with us. Right. And you know, just just what I heard. Um, and so, I, honestly, context is important, especially when reading yeah. verses in the Bible. Sometimes I think there's things in the in the Bible, like stories that they were they were for that time. Right. And it's good to to read them and right. you know and rehearse them. But you know, maybe he was just talking to his friends and saying, "Hey, remember me." You know, we were friends. Right. I don't know if it. it I don't think he meant for a, an entire yeah uh, religious. Um, thing to be created. I so. agree. I totally agree. Thank you. Hey. Because it's more than that. It's more than simply, hey, remember this moment. It's remember what I've done in your whole life. I heard two things when you were speaking. The first thing I heard was that this is an invitation. And it's an invitation to know him more than you know him right at this moment. So if you can see past the tradition and the physical maybe uncomfortableness of moving past something he's inviting you to a place to know him like you never have and if you'll say yes to this thing then there is more to come amen you and then i heard a second thing when i was sitting here i heard him say i am not afraid of your why and what that meant when i heard that i knew it was there are other things besides communion he's looking for you to ask why do i do that it's good. Why am I the one practicing this or rehearsing this? Is it for me? Is it for this day? Is it what I'm supposed to? So he's not afraid of your why. And right. if there are more things you need to ask the question, ask the question. Because Amen. he's big enough to answer you. Amen. Right, so that's Amen. Good. Thank you. It's good. Come here, Gregory. I don't need that. Oh, I'll speak aloud. No, you need this because they're not going to hear you. Oh. They're not going to hear you. All right. Well, I wrote... I wrote this down because this is what God said to me right away. Uh, and this is real simple and sweet. Uh, to be in his word is to eat his flesh and drink his blood. Amen. Amen. It's, just that, it's good. It's just that it's simple. simple. Yes. Thank you. Archie. Thank you. I've been uh, hearing all the time that he has always continuously invited us to commune with him, regardless to whether you're talking about the, the, what we call the one testament as opposed to the second. He has always invited us and said, if you will be my people, if you will make me your God, then you will be my people. You know, in other words, commune with me in the way that you know me that's beyond you know, just the natural thing of just what you can see and what you can feel. But the spirit of God, the idea of being full of the spirit, of the nature of God, has always been present even before the baptism right. of what the Holy right. Spirit. You know what I'm saying? Because he right. said, if you will be my people, if you will be my God, uh, be my people, y'all know what I'm saying. If you will be that, in other words, if you will commune, if you will have relationship with me, then there will be nothing else greater than us right. together. So even now when he talking about what we prefer, refer to as the Last Supper, the scripture that comes to mind to me is Psalms 133 and 1. When he talks about the, the anointing, the, the fellowship, you know, and, and it's like the anointing. He said, behold, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. For it's like the anointing that was on Aaron's head right. and ran down his beard. You know, and when you think about that, how else am I going to know the Father except I know you? So the thing that the Last Supper did, it caused them to know one another. It caused them to know Christ deeper than just, oh, he's Christ Jesus. But he's also a lover of man. Yeah. And that he, because he loved man so much, guess what? We can't love him unless we first do what? Love one another. Amen. 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 Thank you. What I'm going to do is we're going to move forward now. And what I want to do is I want to serve. We're going to serve everybody here. And the way that we're going to do that is I'm going to have two people here, two other, uh, uh, my sons are going to be standing over here. 
they're going to serve you today. And I'm going to ask you to come and line up along these sides, line up on the outside, and then make your way through and get a cracker and get a juice and then go back down the middle uh, to get back into your seat. I think that's going to be the easiest way. But before you do that, I want to do this because it's important to me that you understand what you are doing. This isn't a moment that's like, okay, we're going to do this and feel good about ourselves. We are. I want you to feel good about what you're doing, the decision that you're making. But I also want you to know that this represents your, your walk with him. This is deeper than a cracker and, and juice. It's bigger than that. And somebody might be here, well, I'm not sure you know, where I stand with Christ today. I'm going to give you opportunity right now. I'm going to pray. I'll pray. And in your heart, if you can receive in you what I'm praying, let him change you. Let him bring you into relationship with him through what I'm saying right now. Because I can tell you, you don't have to. You say, I don't know anything about him. I don't, I don't, I, I don't feel like I have a right to receive communion. I want to tell you, if you're walking with him in your heart, you have repented to him and let him become your savior. You have every right to continue to commune with him. Again, my point being, it isn't a five-minute communion. It's communion of a lifetime. So I want everybody to close your eyes this morning. Father, I lift my voice over this congregation. The people that are present in this room, the people that are watching online that will be joining with us today, we are one. We are one. We stand before you today, sit before you today, wherever we're positioned, and we come before you with good and honest hearts. For those that are under the sound of my voice and they are not sure about their place in you, they're not sure if they're qualified to even receive communion today, Father, I pray right now that in them there's a heart of repentance that they repent, they ask you to forgive them, and that they receive you into their life as their Lord and their Savior. Yes. Father, I'm thankful that you are God and there's not another. I'm thankful for your Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent to redeem us and to bring us into a place of life, of life, of relationship, of oneness with the Father. You redeem men and you redeem women. You redeem us. So that we can be your voice, we can be your hands, we can be your feet, we can be your testimony, your witness in the earth today. And I pray that anybody who is not positioned in such a way today, that as they repent, that you forgive. Let it be to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I want you to come stand and come around the side of the room. watching online, we invite you to join with us this morning. If you did not hear me earlier, I would encourage you to go to your kitchen or wherever uh, you might be. If there's a place where you can get something that represents the blood, a drink, and something that represents the flesh, something that you can eat, I would encourage you to go and then hold that. Don't do anything. And then we're going to receive it together today in just a moment. back to your seat if you like. Let me just say as well as you're coming, in the past, I've had people ask about the children. I would encourage you to allow your children to receive communion 
as well. I've heard the argument where people say, well, they don't really know what they're doing. You know, I'm convinced that sometimes they know more about what they're doing than we do. Don't restrain the little children from being a demonstration. just a moment. My wife yesterday, um, or this morning, was sharing with the council when we came in a moment that we had yesterday. Uh, her and I, we were uh, working on our land and we were pulling weeds and, and the weeds have seeds in them that are uh, poisonous. Um, and so we were pulling these weeds, it's five acres, and we're pulling these things out and we're piling them up into a pile. And, and she was uh, sharing this morning how uh, it was important that we burn those because if we do not burn those, what happens is a pile of weeds does not stop the pollen, does not keep them from pollinating. It's important. It was important that when we piled those weeds up that we also light those weeds on fire so that all the seeds were killed in that pile of weeds. They had berries on them that were purple that were dangerous if ingested. Um, interestingly enough, in the middle of all of that, we also killed a coral snake that had, that had meandered in there. But the point being, sometimes you have to take what has been, what looks like it is taking over your land. There might be things that feel like it's taking over your land, taking over your world. I want to tell you, today, as we commune, as we break the bread, as we drink of this juice that represents... I'm eating his flesh and I'm drinking his blood and in so doing what I'm doing is I'm letting him begin to pull some weeds and I'm reminded of this he's going to do it today and he's going to do it tomorrow and he's going to do it the next day because I'm eating his flesh and I'm drinking his blood he's setting fire to the seeds that are not of him so that they cannot produce again in me what is not of him amen stand with me this morning again please if you would so we're going to receive first the bread. And what I want to say about that is this, is this represents the flesh of Christ. This represents that part of him that was so clear and evident and obvious. It's, it's completely visible. What was on the outside of him and who he was was visible. His love for people, the passion that he had, all of that was very visible. When we partake of that, we take that nature upon ourselves. We receive of that same nature. That People do not go unnoticed. We're aware. We're, we become servants. We're not people who are always looking to get, but we are looking for ways to serve. When we eat this cracker today, in our hand it is nothing more than a round or odd-shaped piece of salted flour. 
It's not going to do anything health-wise. It's not going to help you. But by the Spirit today, when you eat it, I hope you get past that and you dive a little bit deeper and you recognize that when I put this thing in my mouth and I chew this thing, I am eating the flesh of Christ. So I want you to hold that up with me this morning if you would. Father, we hold up today what represents for us today, what represents the flesh of Christ. We hold up before you today this and we're about to eat this. And we're going to eat this because in our heart, it is our heart and desire to eat the flesh of Christ. You said, I must eat your flesh so that I can have life in me. I choose life. I choose life. We choose life today, Father. We choose life today. We choose life. In this communion, eating this cracker while it's going to happen in 30 seconds or less. This is not something that's going to come and go in our lives. But when we're walking out of this building... We're declaring and we're choosing, Father, that we are communing with you at 1 o'clock and 2 o'clock and 3 o'clock and every moment of every day. So today we eat. We eat declaring that as we put this in our mouth and we receive this into ourselves, we are receiving the nature of Christ in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. the same way we hold up this cup Father we hold this up before you as a congregation of believers as people who love you it is our heart our passion our desire to honor you in all things and even though this little cup of grape juice Father is exactly that it's a little cup of grape juice that I hold in my hand our heart and our prayer is this that you understand that as we dive deep that we drink the blood of Christ today we in our heart and soul are drinking the blood of Christ we are a blood deep people father we're going beyond flesh only and we're diving into the deep things on the on the flesh level everything that you are I can see but at the blood level I have to walk with you to know you at the blood level I have to make a choice to walk with you on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday And this represents my commitment to commune with you, not only right now, but every day and every moment of every day to have that blood deep relationship with you so that you are glorified in my life and all around me. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. Come on, lift your hands. Father, we lift our voice today. Put your hands on yourself. Father, we lift our voice and we lay our hands upon ourselves today and we declare that our minds are renewed today. That there's a deeper understanding of what communion is. It isn't the five minute thing that happens so frequently. It isn't the dumbed down version of what true relationship is. But communion is the walk that we, we have with you every minute of every day that we are breathing. Father, today we lay hands on ourselves and we declare today that we commit ourselves completely to you. All that we are, everything that we are, that we recognize what is of you and our eyes are open to recognize what is not of you. And through communion, it's an easy decision to walk away, walk away from what isn't of you and to embrace what is. Because of our relationship with you and through communion with you, Father, it is an easy thing to position ourselves to rise up and to be your testimony and to be your witness. Be glorified in our lives as we walk out of this place today. Be glorified in each of our lives today. This week, tomorrow, be glorified. May we be a demonstration and a testimony of the goodness of God. Father, let all the earth hear the sound of a people from the Rock of Central Florida that are lifting up their voices and honoring Almighty God. Let there be a sound that comes forth from this house, a sound of jubilee, a sound of shouting, a sound of relationship, a sound today of freedom, a sound of liberty, a sound of sonship. Father, let there be a sound. And let every hearer, let all who hear the sound coming out of the lives of this house, let them hear the voice of God within the voice of this people so that you are glorified. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. Come on, put your hands together this morning. Hallelujah.